Hello and welcome to Portfolio Diversification Part 2. In the first part we looked at standard deviation as a measure of volatility and risk. We saw how combining investments with a low degree of correlation with one another helped to reduce overall portfolio risk. We looked at efficient frontiers and the Sharpe ratio as a measure of risk-adjusted return, which is also a handy means of comparing portfolios which differ in risk and return characteristics. Now let's take a step further into the real world of investing in multiple asset classes. Today, wealth offerings provide a bewildering range of investment classes to choose from, and the proliferation of exchange-traded funds and specialised funds make access to certain asset classes easier, cheaper and more liquid too. Beyond the traditional investments of cash, bonds, equities and FX, there's a plethora of alternative investments to choose from, including commodities, hedge funds, private equity, real estate and even art, fine wine or forestry. Now, if you were going to construct a well-diversified portfolio, you would probably agree that you would want to include some alternative investments, given their low degree of correlation with traditional investments and therefore their contribution to reducing overall portfolio risk. Well, it is possible to be overly diversified, and for that reason you wouldn't necessarily want to include too many different types of asset classes. To illustrate what we mean by this, let's turn now to a study that was conducted by UBS Wealth Management a while back. They looked at the historical returns over the past 20 years for 13 different asset classes. Different permutations of some or all of these asset classes created portfolios with widely varying sharp ratios, most of which were between 0.5 and 0.9. In terms of risk-adjusted returns, clearly some of the portfolios were duds. Some, were, of course, were champions, sitting right on the efficient frontier. The interesting thing is that the best available sharp ratios were higher and higher with each additional asset class being added to portfolios. Note that this chart summarises the sharp ratios of more than 8,000 portfolio permutations. So don't be fooled into thinking that a certain number of assets will definitely produce these sharp ratios. The levels are actually best indicated by dirty thumbprints. In this case, a thumbprint covers two thirds of the portfolios measured in each category. But it's also important to note that portfolios containing more asset classes reflect ever tighter ranges of sharp ratios. All in all, it would seem that the more asset classes you include in a portfolio, the higher the sharp ratio you are likely to achieve. But so far we're ignoring one crucial element, that of costs. Every transaction involves costs, and the more asset classes contained in a portfolio, the heavier the cost burden becomes. And this has a noticeable impact on sharp ratios. Adding the dirty thumbprints to give an idea of variation of outcomes, we can see that there clearly is such a thing as over-diversification. And there's a point at which additional costs start to outweigh the efficiency gains. Thus, in practice, it's best to stop at about seven or eight asset classes when building a diversified portfolio. Another piece of practical advice when constructing a well-diversified portfolio with alternative asset classes is the contribution that that asset class makes towards the overall reduction of portfolio risk. Because on the one hand, you may have the disadvantage of higher costs on the other hand, you have the advantage of a lower level of correlation with the other asset classes within that portfolio. This is a trade-off that's fairly unique depending on the asset class involved, which means that this is something that really has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. As a general observation, though, bonds tend to have a noticeably positive contribution to the efficiency of multi-asset portfolios, partly because of the low correlation with other asset classes like equities, but also partly because they carry low transaction costs. Also, hedge funds, even though they involve higher transaction costs, nonetheless stand out as delivering significant efficiency gains to multi-asset portfolios. Now, the findings that I've just presented are based on historical returns and a passive exposure to various asset classes. It's a conveniently neutral place to start from a theoretical point of view. But the reality is that investors often prefer to take an active approach to investing in the belief that they can pick asset classes that will outperform others within their time horizon. Watch out for my next video then, which will go into greater detail 
the comparison between active and passive investing. Until then, goodbye.